Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. This is your Linux and open source news roundup for the month of August. Let's start. This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode lets you set up your own server to host a website, set up a VPN, create a Nextcloud instance, host a game server, and even more. Linode offers Linux-based configurations. If it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. They have 24-7 support by phone or support ticket, and pricing starts at $5 and is capped, so you won't get any hidden fees or surprise bills. Sign up with the link in the description below to get a $20 credit to set up your own Linux server using the code LINUXEXP19. August the 1st. GNOME and KDE announced that they would work together on building better Linux desktops. At Linux App Summit, they'll co-host a conference to try and bring app developers together and advance the whole Linux desktop. This is a fantastic move and I hope they manage to set some standards and entice app developers to make their various programs work better on all Linux desktops. We'll have to see where this goes and what comes out of this, but I can only applaud the cooperation. XR Desktop, a VR-enabled Linux desktop, will now allow you to use your Linux programs while wearing your VR headset. The project is backed by Valve, and while it still requires some setup with a specific display driver, it's still fun to see that existing technology can be tweaked to work with newer systems and interaction models. I'm not convinced VR is the most practical or efficient way to interact with the traditional desktop with its windows and menus, but it could open the door to much more fun paradigms. August 2nd. Responding to the European Commission's fines, Google announced that it would allow other search engines to be present at Android setup. Users will be able to pick between Google and three other search providers, but there's a catch. Google will ask them to bid on an amount they are ready to pay for each user that chooses to use their engine and select the three highest bidders, which will then be billed each month for the amount they bid for, times the number of users that opted for their search services. This obviously is a snarky answer to the EU, and I hope it's stopped in its tracks. Asking for its competitors to pay to have the option to be selected by users is obviously against the letter of the European law and does not foster a healthy competitive environment. Wine 4.13 was released with 15 bug fixes and a few improvements. An issue affecting multiple games using Direct 3D 11 has been fixed, as well as bugs for Final Fantasy XIV. August the 3rd. Manjaro listened to the community feedback on their decision to include FreeOffice by default in their distro. It seems that users will now be given a choice at installation. They'll be able to pick between FreeOffice, LibreOffice or no Office Suite at all. This is a good thing, since it only gives users more options and show that Manjaro is open to constructive criticism on these topics. August the 5th. The Igalia Multimedia Team, a free software consultancy company based in Spain, announced that they are working to integrate the Open Timeline I.O. format into GStreamer. What this means is that programs based on that multimedia framework, like PTV, will be able to open projects made in other editing software like Final Cut Pro X. There is no word on when the changes will be released, but they also added nested timeline support to the GStreamer editing services, which means users working on larger projects will be able to work on smaller chunks of the project instead of a huge timeline. These improvements are awesome, and might be well enough for me to take another look at PTV, which I really liked when I used it at the beginning of the channel, especially since its interface is a lot more GNOME-like than Caden Lives. DXVK 1.3.2 has been released, fixing a bunch of bugs in Dishonored 2, The Division, Anno 1800 or Sunset Overdrive. In addition, DirectX 11 games should see reduced CPU overhead. Nvidia users should also get a little more stability. It's a small bug fix release, but the power of this piece of software still amazes me every time I start a Windows game on my Linux desktop. August the 6th. Microsoft might be bringing its Steam software to Linux. While I personally use Slack for work, I guess having more options is always a good thing, and Microsoft Teams seems to be one of the company's priorities at the moment, with good growth in user numbers. While I don't plan to use it, I feel it's a good thing to see Microsoft bringing its services to Linux, and if the reception is good, one could imagine they'll bring even more stuff, for example Office. Martin Wimpress from the canonical Snapcraft team gave a very nice interview to the Tech Republic website on why snaps are a distro agnostic solution the problem they are trying to solve, and a bit of its history. It's an interesting piece that sheds new light on some of the main points the community brings up on Snaps, such as its proprietary components, the Ubuntu branding, and its future plans. 
A discussion took place on how to improve Linux desktop performance in low RAM scenarios. At present, the kernel tends to make everything stall once no more RAM or swap is available, and the desktop becomes virtually unusable with an immobile mouse pointer and everything frozen in place. Some solutions are proposed to make sure these kind of scenarios can be handled more gracefully. August the 7th. A KDE vulnerability has been outed publicly before notifying the developers, which is always a bad practice. The problem seems to be that KDE parses any file that uses the .desktop file header style, which could lead to your system executing malicious programs disguised as .desktop files. This flaw has been patched the next day, so if you haven't already, do look for updates in your package manager to make sure your system is secure. NVIDIA has open sourced a bunch of documentation for its GPUs. Everything is available on GitHub, and while this does not cover every card or architecture yet, they seem to be willing to release documentation on most of their GPUs. This is a good move, since it will allow the Nouveau driver team to advance much quicker on the open source NVIDIA driver. Of course, I would have preferred them to open source the driver entirely, but still, this is a very good first step. I'm excited to see what will come of this. Linux Journal announced that they would cease their publication. They let off the whole staff and declare they have no more funds left to run the company. This comes less than two years after the magazine has been saved by its readers, and it's sad news. While I was never a subscriber myself, Linux Journal was a quality publication and will be missed. I hope their vast archive can be hosted somewhere so it can be accessed even after the death of the company. August the 8th. Proton 4.11-2 has been released, updating DXVK to version 1.3.2 and F-Audio to the latest available release. It also upgrades Mono for better .NET support and allow older games to access a fixed 60fps mode which should fix issues on displays with higher frame rates. It also fixes a few bugs on various games. LibreOffice 6.3 has been released as well, bringing a bunch of improvements to the Office suite. The compact notebook bar mode is now available for all pieces of the suite, calc as a new widget for quick access to the most used functions, and PDF export has been enhanced. Creating fillable PDF forms is also now easier thanks to a new form menu in Writer. Documents can also now be redacted to hide sensitive information. Microsoft Office compatibility has received some love as well, with support for exporting document templates like .x, importing smart art graphics, and better support for pivot tables in Calc. August the 12th. XFCE 4.14 was released after 4 years and 5 months of work. The main features are support for vSync in the Window Manager, as well as high DPI support and support for graphical acceleration with the NVIDIA proprietary driver. Users can now change color profiles in the settings, and multi-display configs can be saved and restored to avoid having to set up everything by hand every time you plug some displays on a laptop, for example. The file manager received a lot of attention as well, and so did the media player with a mini mode and support for network streams and podcasts. This doesn't cover half the bug fixes and improvements, so I encourage you to read the announcement, or better try XFCE for yourself. I haven't paid much attention to this desktop environment yet, but it's about to change soon. August the 16th. Wine 4.14 was released with a brand new version of the Mono engine and some fixes on ARM64. Games are not left behind either, with 18 issues fixed for games like Star Citizen, The Sims or World War Z. Kiddenlife 18.08 has been released, bringing some new features as well. 3-point editing initial support is now implemented, which is a method to quickly add clips to your timeline using the keyboard. Grouped audio and video clips can now be resized individually pressing Shift, and these clips can be moved independently to other tracks. You can seek through clips in the clip bin while pressing Shift and hovering over the clip, and speed can be adjusted in the timeline by dragging with holding control. A ton of bugs also have been fixed to make InLive more stable. It's still my video editor of choice, and I like to see it picking up steam and bringing improvements. August the 18th. The Linux on Dex project now allows to run Ubuntu 16.04 LTS on a Samsung smartphone. For those not familiar with the project, it's based on Samsung's Dex efforts to allow plugging your phone into a monitor and use it as a desktop, but replacing the Android desktop with a Linux one. This is impressive, and close to the vision that Ubuntu had initially with Unity 8 and Convergence. August the 22nd. 
ProtonDB, the website which lists user reports and grades Linux-compatible games through Proton, seems to indicate that we passed the 6,000 playable games mark, out of 9,000 for which users have created a report. These games are all rated Gold or Platinum, which means that these games work about as well on Linux as they do on Windows, with no tweaks or very little tweaks needed. It's great to see that in about a year of Proton's existence, Linux can now reliably be used to play a huge number of the available games out there. Gnome Feeds has been released on FlatHub, and it's a simple app to read RSS feeds on Gnome. It's a simple, straightforward piece of software, but for people who still rely on the ancient technology to stay up to date with the news, it's a great one. If you're still stuck on RSS feeds like me, give it a go, it's worth a try. August the 24th. The Enlightenment desktop released its first version in two years, Enlightenment 0.23.0. The feature list is quite small, including the option to take a padded screenshot, adding music playback control support, moving windows while alt-tabbing, and improving Wayland support. Rage, the audio player for the Enlightenment desktop, also saw an update. While I never tried this desktop yet, it seems like a great, minimal and lightweight option. I'll make sure to look into it in the future. August 25th. Linux celebrated its 28th birthday. Starting out from a pet project from Linux Torvalds, something he said wouldn't be big or professional, it's now the dominant OS in the server market. So much so that Windows now uses it for its Windows subsystem for Linux, and Microsoft even proposes its own Linux distro for its Azure cloud services. August the 26th. D9VK 0.20 has been released, adding a number of DirectX 9 features, which should improve support for Undertale and Unreal Engine 3 titles. A lot of bugs have been fixed as well, and the developers have worked on bringing performance improvements all around. D9VK is now included in Proton, so you should get the update soon. You still need to enable it manually in the Steam launch options, but a quick visit on ProtonDB should be enough to make sure which games work better with it. August the 27th. Proton 4.11-3 was released, with big changes to how gamepads are supported. Previously, they were all considered as emulating an Xbox controller, but now they'll be properly recognized and accessed by the games directly, which means that PS4 controllers should now work better with Steam Play. F-Sync, which aims to replace E-Sync, has been improved, and language fonts have been added. The in-game web browsers should behave better, and older VR titles should now work better as well. It includes the latest version of D9VK as noted previously, so older games should also see some improvements. Head to the Steam preferences to select 4.11-3 as the default for your games. Microsoft announced that they would bring XFAT support to the Linux kernel. This file system is mainly used for external USB devices and has been created in 2006. This file system was proprietary and thus required licensing fees, but soon that won't be the case anymore. It's good to see Microsoft being more rational about these kind of things. August the 28th. Thunderbird 68 was released, bringing a new, more legible app menu and replacing the Preferences dialog with a tab more in line with what's done in Firefox. It now supports full color for text and has improvements for its dark theme. It's good to see improvements to the email client's interface, and I hope they keep on revamping it, as it's the only thing preventing me from using it as a desktop client these days. Collabora has published an update on their work on VirGL Renderer, a solution to emulate a GPU while using a virtual machine through QEMU. They showed off the tech by playing Tomb Raider, Alien Isolation, Outlast, Metro Last Light, and other games with this solution. This could bridge the gap to being able to easily play games not supported on Linux through a virtual machine, and though performance won't be close to native, it's still better than not being able to play at all. August the 30th. Wine 4.15 was released, adding initial implementation for HTTP and a few bug fixes for Dragon Age Origins, Titanfall 2, Guild Wars, World of Warcraft, and the anti-cheat system Battle Eye. It should be included in later releases of Proton soon. DXVK also saw a release, bringing it to version 1.3.3. The new release fixes issues in Far Cry Primal and Steam VR. It's a very small one, but it's still nice to see the project moving at such a rapid pace. And that's it for August. I hope you enjoyed this roundup of Linux and open source news. If you did, don't hesitate to like, subscribe and turn on notifications. If you really like this kind of videos, I also have a Patreon page. Check it out using the link in the description. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!